The Lionel Gelber Prize is awarded every year to the best book on international affairs. To mark the 25th anniversary, we spoke with five Gelber winners. I asked them how the world has changed. My name is John Stackhouse, and here is what I learned. We're at Columbia University, and I'm joined by Steve Call, Dean of Journalism at Columbia and author of Ghost Wars, a Gelber Prize winner. Steve, thanks for joining us. Glad to be with you. Steve, let me take you back to 1990, uh, the end of the Cold War. Were there any cues at the time that we might now see better in hindsight to indicate that the world would shift from the state-driven Cold War conflict to a new era of uh, conflict and tension with rogue players and non-state actors? I think some of what was ahead was foreseeable and was noted at the time, and some was not. So within a year after the fall of the Berlin Wall, it was clear that the end of international Soviet communism was going to produce a resurgence, a revival of uh, religious politics, of ethnic uh, and nationalist and separatist politics. And so you could see that there was a a return uh, to long lines of identity politics that had somewhat been suppressed and smothered up by the uh, Soviet Union. I think what was harder to foresee was how that pattern, this revival of identity politics, would uh, be empowered by technology, globalization, and communication as rapidly as it, as it was in the two decades after 1990. Today we have stateless groups uh, trading on religious identity politics, such as ISIS, that manage their own media operations, their own um, branding uh, strategies and recruitment strategies without uh, really much need for the formal mechanisms of the state because of the way technology makes it possible to sort of self-empower, uh, as we see in so many other areas of society. That's a very interesting point about uh, globalization and technology. Who's the winner from that? Is it the, uh, the identity groups or the states that they target? Yeah, it's a great, I mean, it's, it's the question of our age, who wins uh, the authoritarian adaptation and control of these uh, technologies or the citizens that at least at the beginning thought they would be um, empowered in a, in a completely new way. And I, I tend to think that the states are winning. Um, there are aspects of uh, digital technology and communications networks that states will never be able to control. There are ways that these technologies empower citizens and individuals and collapse, say, the barriers to entry in communication. But um, we see authoritarian states very cleverly finding they were, their way back notwithstanding those problems, to directly control some and then manage quite a lot of the rest, uh, China being you know, the most explicit model of how to do it. In the hunt for bin Laden and the pursuit of al-Qaeda, what were the greatest steps in hindsight and perhaps the greatest missteps? Well, bin Laden announced himself as being at war with the West about 1996, and there were a handful of intelligence officers who were aware of him and were tracking him, trying to photograph him, trying to understand who he was and who he was working with. But there was no national attention uh, until 1998 when uh, Al-Qaeda bombed two U.S. embassies in Africa. So that was a missed opportunity. Most of the 1990s, he was there to be understood. He was there to be watched. The problem wasn't attention to him. Between 1998 and 2001, the CIA was chasing him around. There were all kinds of half-baked plans to locate him and, and either capture him or kill him. The problem was there was no sense of urgency in the political leadership in the United States or in Europe, for that matter, about not just bin Laden himself, but al-Qaeda and the emerging kind of capacity that some of these uh, cells were demonstrating in specific attacks. Uh, and so then you got 9-11, uh, which sort of shocked the system. And um, I think there was an understandable confusion in the U.S. intelligence system immediately after 9-11 about what this attack represented. Did, did this mean that they had this kind of capacity spread all over? eight or nine groups with similar capabilities and plans? Or was this a moonshot? Was this a one in a million 
um, hit that they had, and it, it took a while to clarify that it was the latter. A lot of what you say about what was missed in the uh, pursuit of Al-Qaeda sounds similar to what is said today about what was missed in the rise of ISIS. What should we reflect on in terms of the similarities? Mm, yes, I mean, there's certainly a similarity. Well, ISIS is really a, a child of Al-Qaeda. It was originally Al-Qaeda in Iraq, and it evolved uh, in the context of the end of the, of the Iraq war that started with the U.S. invasion. And so um, there is a um, speed and a complexity about the way um, Al-Qaeda-related, Al-Qaeda-inspired, Al-Qaeda-affiliated groups uh, evolve and how their resources evolve and then how they uh, embed themselves in settings of conflict. That's another parallel, I think, between ISIS and Al-Qaeda. One of the reasons why 9-11 uh, was not prevented was that even though the intelligence community recognized and warned uh, two presidents that Al-Qaeda was metastasizing in Afghanistan, Afghanistan was such a mess uh, and would have required such military effort and risk to go in after this small group uh, that it just seemed like too hard of a problem. There was this desire in the, in the understandable desire in the foreign policy establishment to try to narrow the problem to just striking Al-Qaeda, let's leave Afghanistan out of it. Well, ISIS was a similar uh, incubation. It arose in the context of a failing Iraqi state. It arose in the context of the Syrian civil war. And nobody wanted a part of those wars, uh, certainly not in, in the Obama administration. And, and it was that, that was the environment in which ISIS kind of incubated. Of course, reliable allies can be very helpful. And one thing the U.S. has learned over the last uh, decade or so is how ambiguous the relationship can be with some of its most important allies, specifically Pakistan and uh, Saudi Arabia. Has America come to grips with that relationship and have those allies come to grips with America? Yeah, both relationships are, are, have a kind of permanent volatility to them and the volatility is often located in the very question you're asking, which is, are we allies, are we enemies? What are our shared interests? How do we manage our differences? In the case of Pakistan, there was an early um, and uh, over-inflated faith in President Musharraf's decision to turn uh, to support the U.S. invasion of Afghanistan and only a late recognition that while he was willing to cooperate um, against al-Qaeda terrorists uh, to a very significant degree. He was never going to change the regional policies that had supported the rise of the Taliban and so forth. So that was a kind of a disillusionment on the American side. Uh, on the Pakistani side, uh, it's kind of hard to say they were disillusioned because they never had faith that the United States would do the right thing in their part of the world. Uh, but they did um, wonder how long the United States would stay in Afghanistan and at a certain point around 2010, uh, even the Pakistanis started to entertain the possibility, well, maybe this could be a more durable friendship. But then came 2011, Raymond Davis, the um, fact that bin Laden was living in the town that also houses Pakistan's main military academy and so forth, and the relationship just fell apart. And in the case of Saudi Arabia, I think it's a slightly different narrative. After 2001, the Saudis were disbelieving of the contextual role that their policies had played in the attacks, the fact that the thugs on the planes were Saudi nationals, all of this, it took them a while to digest that this was uh, true. Um, and then um, they revolted against the hostility that they felt coming at them from the United States, the royal family did. And, uh, and then finally in 2003, the Saudis themselves were attacked by Al-Qaeda cells within the kingdom and facing that threat, they really then turned on Al-Qaeda. I think in both relationships, uh, there's now an equilibrium of uh, mutual recognition that there are enough interests so that the relationship can't just be broken, um, but also mutual recognition that alliance is probably the not, not the right way to describe uh, the partnership. We've seen a great tarnishing of U.S. intelligence going back to WMD and right through WikiLeaks to the recent Senate report on the CIA. How discredited has U.S. intelligence been globally? 
Well, uh, I think globally you have to kind of break it down a little bit. Um, the, in Europe, the conduct of the CIA in participating in torture, in rendering uh, terrorist suspects to countries with records of torture, um, you know, has created breaches in cooperation, practical breaches in cooperation um, that have been consequential. So some European governments, you know, have been reluctant to share information with the CIA because they fear that it would be misused in, in this way. Um, and even the staunchest uh, intelligence partners, such as Britain, have really struggled to figure out how they can work with an agency that doesn't follow the same rule book that they, that they follow. Um, so that has been consequential. I think, you know, in the Middle East uh, and in South Asia, uh, intelligence services with which the CIA partners are pretty rough themselves. Virtually all of them engage in routine uh, abuse of detained suspects. So, you know, the CIA is just in their neighborhood, you know, welcome, you know, welcome to the club. I don't think it's especially consequential. And in an agency like the CIA, it plays off of a kind of an intimidation and a, and a reputation and that it very carefully cultivates to try to uh, coerce people to provide assistance in one environment or another. And so being seen as rogue, dangerous, unpredictable is, you know, from their perspective, operationally not all bad. I think the, you know, the harm is to America's strategic goals of uh, promoting human rights and inclusion, political participation, and um, you know, the rise of peaceful civil societies as economies around the world grow and middle classes form and new countries struggle to define what kind of place they want in the world and what kind of system they want for their citizens. You know, the United States has attempted to be uh, in a leadership role around these very strategic values-driven um, issues, and there's no question that um, that credibility has been badly undermined by these revelations. What do Americans make of uh, counterterrorism? You know, I was talking to a former uh, leader of uh, the National Intelligence Directorate once, and, and we were talking about some other controversy around the CIA's conduct since 2001 and, and whether it would lead to reform or some kinds of new constraints. And he, he turned to me and he said, you know, America loves its CIA. It needs its CIA. <laughs> and you know, if you look at Hollywood and, and public opinion polls and the kind of cultural context that the CIA has actually managed to shape as well as enjoy, uh, it, that's true. Uh, this, is a, uh, you know, this is a rough country. Uh, this is a frontier country that likes its guns, uh, maintains uh, an adamant belief in the death penalty when many other uh, developed democracies have moved away from it. And if you look at public opinion polling about just the raw question of is torture justified if there's a ticking bomb scenario with terrorists? You know, the numbers are a little bit shocking. They're well above 50%. Of course, this is a false paradigm, which the CIA and Hollywood have helped to construct, that there is a ticking bomb scenario out there every other day and that, and that torture works. Both of those propositions, I believe, are empirically false. Uh, but nonetheless, they are widely believed. And, uh, and one of the sad things about the debate that emerged after the torture report was published is that the CIA, in defending the conduct of its uh, officers and its prerogatives in the Washington system, you know, really took up vocally the argument that torture works. Uh, and they may have, it may have been in the context of saying, well, we're not doing it anymore, and we understand that a lot of people think it was wrong, and even some of us think it not consistent with America's values, but let, it, let there be no doubt it works. Now, that's just really unhelpful, and uh, it's, it's a reflection of how polarized and defensive uh, the climate around these issues in Washington remains. How is the threat of cyber warfare changing intelligence? I think it's the main game uh, coming, uh, it's, and cyber is the most important new field of defense competition and probably the no most important uh, new field of warfare looking out over 20 or 40 years. You know, I think um, 
It's very early. There are no norms, so it feels a little bit like the early nuclear period. You have a lot of competing states secretly building up capabilities, testing their capabilities, and searching for sustainable doctrines. Some of the sustainable doctrines that uh, people are obviously experimenting with involve um, uh, very dangerous uh, and potentially disruptive hacking activity, um, both directly by states and through proxy groups. And there, there really, um, you know, it does feel like nuclear 1949, uh, where people were building nuclear artillery shells and thinking about carrying nuclear rifles onto the battlefield, and there was no discussion about how to prevent proliferation or how to regulate deterrence, and and uh, so I, I, f I fear this uh, evolution. Um, I note that states with a lot to lose uh, in cyber conflict are starting to recognize that this instability is, is not a good thing and starting to talk a little bit about how you'd get to norms uh, and rules. Um, but I think for weaker states and for rising powers, the status quo where they can use um, deniable groups and, and distributed attacks to disrupt uh, the United States or, or Western uh, societies and governments uh, without much accountability um, is not, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's attractive to them. Uh, you certainly see that in Russia today. I think it's inevitable that uh, there will be a really major cyber disruption. Um, probably in the United States, but it could be someplace else in the developed world. This pattern of what's going on now, the report week after week of a major intrusion, often against commercial, soft commercial targets, to me it's like the pattern of Al-Qaeda attacks before 9-11. You had lying right in plain sight, determined attackers working in small uh, but very talented and well-resourced groups, again and again uh, declaring their intent carrying out effective, reasonably small-scale attacks against vulnerable targets. Uh, and on the defensive side, nobody recognized this pattern as a serious enough threat to harden up all the targets. Well, the, the parallel is that in the United States, we put all of our defensive policies into the commercial sector. There is no uniform regulation about how hard the, any company's target needs to be, but it's all linked together, including utilities. Uh, so. You know, if you had a 9-11 style talented group that uh, had the resources and, and the, uh, the ambition, you, know, you could do something pretty disruptive. What states concern you most in terms of cyber capabilities? Well, China and Russia are obviously very active um, uh, these days and they have very talented uh, people either directly or indirectly uh, working on their, their behalf. I think over the next 20 or 30 years, especially just thinking about different scenarios of, of evolution in the international system, their um, unconventional and asymmetric uh, and technological capabilities are obviously going to be vital to their ability to claim a place of you know, great power status uh, in the international system. They're, you know, China is an interesting example because they're attempting to build up a traditional new great power conventional force with uh, you know, maritime capabilities and an air force and obviously a ballistic missile force. But to them, the great opportunity is to leap past the competition in conventional forces with the United States and develop parity or even superiority in the new fields of cyber and satellite uh, uh, warfare. And, um, you know, that's, that's what they're doing. You know, the Russians are in a more defensive position and, and don't have the national resources and the national economy and the population that China has to work with, but they're, but they're pursuing a similar asymmetric strategy. Just as they retain nuclear weapons in order to remain relevant, they're going to develop an offensive cyber capability to compensate for the fact that they're weak in other areas of global competition. Reflecting back 25 years ago to 1990, there was an optimism in the world. Today, in 2015, do you feel more optimistic or pessimistic? No, I think overall the world is getting better and it's also getting more volatile. Uh, the world is getting better because more and more people are rising out of poverty and entering into um, you know, normal political societies. We should 
continue to make advances in human welfare and, and life expectancy and prosperity. The problem is that the way technology and the economies and communication and uh, the combination of computers and communication ha is evolving, we are at the same time almost guaranteeing more shocks and more volatility. We're just plugging the whole world ever more tightly together, speeding up the pace of information, empowering small groups. Uh, you know, the pace of change, it's, it's almost a principle of, math, of network mathematics that when you build a system of globalization like the one we're building with computers and speed, you're going to get volatility. And we see it in the financial markets and we see it in the rise of groups like ISIS uh, overnight and their ability to empower themselves through their own engagement with uh, global technologies and communications. And you have these concentrations of talent and power in big cities. They're natural targets. So to me, 9-11 uh, is a model of the security challenge of the future, not necessarily from terrorists. It could be from epidemics or cyber attacks or climate change. But you have, um, in general, a world that is getting wealthier and healthier. But you are also looking at a world that is more subject to sudden shocks. How confident are you in the West's ability to manage that volatility? Not very confident. I think the problem is that the, the West's vision of where the volatility is coming from is almost always retrospective, and the systems are usually way ahead of the bureaucracy. So yes, on 9-11, uh, the United States obviously wildly overreacted to the threat, though understandably so, because it didn't know and nobody knew how many of these cells were out there and what was coming next. But it did, uh, with all of the wasted money and the uh, misguided uh, military adventurism, it did build a harder wall. And it's now very difficult for anybody who's you know, a known Al-Qaeda affiliate or someone who's volunteered to fight in Syria to get on a plane and fly into New York. It's just, you, can't, you can't do it very successfully anymore. So that was a hardened response to the attack. And this will happen in pattern. So there will be um, a serious cyber disruption and then people will finally get their defenses in order. We did this in the nuclear age and I keep thinking about that when I try to remain optimistic. You know, the world came very close to catastrophe between nuclear tests uh, and the use of those weapons in Japan and the Cuban Missile Crisis. In, in that span of about 17 years, this hugely destructive new technology almost uh, was used uh, multiple times. And in the Cuban crisis, it could have been used in a, in a way that would have ended civilization as we know it. And yet somehow, retrospectively, defensively, uh, this international system and the governments of two very hostile states, the United States and Soviet Union, gradually regulated and built a system of deterrence and mutual transparency that finally stabilized this, this very threatening new technology. So I, I think with cyber, we're going to have to go through some kind of pattern of discovery like that. Uh, small states are going to find themselves empowered by this technology. There will be some disruptions. but. I, I, I'm hopeful that the international system will figure out a way to regulate that technology as well and uh, create a sense of mutual deterrence and stability. Steve Cole, thank you very much for talking to us today. Thanks, John. I enjoyed talking to you.